Okay. Go on, people are joining. Come on, you can start now. Okay, that's fine. So, no, thank you very much, Manava, for asking me to talk on um, the current concept of NTI shoulder instability. So, I'll go through some of the evidence and uh, what I think so is important. And uh, we'll talk about it uh, at the end. So, uh, I don't have any disclosures apart from that I teach you on, on some courses. I don't have any conflict of interest. Right. So, for me, when I have a patient with NTI shoulder instability, I have two questions. Um, do they have bone loss? Uh, and because I want to know if they have bone loss because I know these are the patients who will fail with surgical uh, arts repair. And uh, if if I can identify patients who are going to fail, then I need to know what I can do what to avoid this failure. So um, can you see this images on the right? I don't know if yeah, you, yeah. Can. you can. Okay, that's fine. So I think so. The most Probably most quoted uh, shoulder paper is probably this one from Burkhardt and De Beers. When they looked at, uh, I think so, just over 160 patients, uh, who were, most of them were actually quite a lot of them were contact at least to see uh, what's happening. And so they did uh, arthroscopic repair and they looked at it. Uh, two th they found out two things patients who had more than 25% of glenoid bone loss. Okay. They have high failure rate, and their failure rate was about six, about seventy percent. Okay. And then the other thing they came out was this uh, a term called engaging hill sacks, and it was basically um, when uh, when they put arm in ninety degree of abduction and ninety degree of external rotation. If the hill sack is in line with the anterior glenoid, then they have higher recurrence rate. <coughs> And they also noticed that uh, probably about 90% of the contact they failed if uh, they have glenoid bone loss. So, sorry, can I request whoever is not uh, uh, teaching or just listening, can they close their mics off because there's a lot of noise in the background. So please close your mics off, yeah? And, and if you have to have a question, then you can ask. But let Nasir continue and please close your mics in the background, yeah? Like, you know, this is the, probably the first time when the concept of bipolar bone loss was introduced to some extent. Okay. Then uh, Pascal Bello came up with this um, um, scoring system of uh, instability, severity, index score. And again, if you notice, he, at the bottom of uh, his uh, prognostic factor, he, he mentioned glenoid bone loss. Okay, so on the radiograph, if you can't see the erotic, uh, glenoid line, then it is uh, probably glenoid bone loss and also in a hill sex and external rotation. Um, and he noticed that patients who had, uh, so this was a prospective study, he noticed that patients who had more than six points, they had 70% of failures. Again, these are the big bosses of uh, shoulder surgery in the world. This had 70% failure rate. But is this injury, so, uh, instability, severity score is important or not? So I found out two studies. So one is from American Journal of Sports Medicine. Instead of six, they noticed their failure rate was about 70%. Even if ISI score was four or more. And again, Lopini noticed that their failure rate was up to about 50% if the score was more than six. So, in, in my opinion, I, in stability, severity, the score is quite important. So, going back to bone loss, okay, so. How do you measure bone loss? So Burkhardt again came up with this idea of uh, intraoperative calibrated uh, probe and, to, and using this probe to measure uh, how much bone loss is there. So he came up with this, uh, I, uh, this calculation, which I don't think so it took off because when you measure, like you identified on probe, you don't have enough time to, cal to do this calculation as surgeons. We usually probably like to avoid calculation intraoperatively. Third thing uh, can I noticed was um, there's a good, very good couple of good, very good papers from um, uh, Jani, and he looked at how much bone loss is important on the hypnol side, and they did some cadaveric studies, and they noticed that at, if you take if the hill sex is about fifth eighth of uh, of the humeral head, then it becomes quite significant, and they noticed that this is the position when your arm is in mid abduction, so mid abduction. And 45, and 45 de about a 45 degree and then external rotation. And if you notice the bottom screen I put there, that in a normal apprehension examination, we put patients to about 90 degree of uh, abduction and then external rotation. So this was again a new thing that you made, you, you, uh, 
examine patients should have about 45 degree of abduction and external rotation. So, sorry, Nasir, everybody saying your volume is low to them. Is there any way you can come nearer to your microphone? I can come more clear. Is it, is it any better? This is much better. Thank you. So, so, so from this paper, I learned that examination of patients who have significant bone loss, um, you have to do apprehension tested mid-abduction, not a 90 degree. So if, they are, if, they are uns, if they feel apprehension at mid-abduction, that is quite important. Uh, it gives you an idea that they have uh, significant bone loss. Then Yamamoto came up with this idea of glenoid track. And what is a glenoid track? Basically, a contact area of glenoid on the humeral surface. So on the top picture, they, note they, they looked at the contact area of uh, glenoid on humeral head in different positions. So you can see some uh, in polar, uh, a zero degree of abduction, 30 degrees, and, and 60 degrees. And they come up with this idea of glenoid track that this is the amount of glenoid which comes in contact with humeral head. These people have looked at it and they found out that the amount of the width of the humeral uh, width of the glenoid track is about 83% of the glenoid. Uh, so that's, that's again one thing very important. I'll come back to later on. So, uh, Burkhart and uh, a toy, and uh, they come up with this concept of. Uh, on track and off track lesions. Okay. I don't know if people are familiar with this, this concept or not. Okay. But this is again their um, attempt to measure bipolar bone loss. So we know this yellow line is um, your glenoid track. Okay. This glenoid track can be small or large. Oh, well, it, it can be remain small, it can't go large. Okay. Depending upon the glenoid bone loss. But how important is hill size? <laughs> So if the hill sac is small and it's within, gleno, it's within the glenoid track, like from the top picture, you can see the glenoid track is yellow and the hill sac lesion is blue. So the hill sac lesion is within glenoid track and they call it an on track lesion. But if in the bottom picture that you see, if the hill sac is bigger than the glenoid track, it is more medial to the glenoid track, then it's called an off track track lesion. Okay. So I usually give the analogy of uh, tires and potholes. Okay. So if your tire, car tire or bicycle tire it, it is big enough, bigger than the pothole, then you won't feel it just like the top pothole. Okay. So near to the, to the, uh, to the tire. So if the Pothole is smaller, or the or the width of the tire is bigger, then you won't feel it. But if the pothole is bigger, or the width of the tire is smaller, then you'll feel the bump. Okay? And this is the same concept with glenoid uh, on and off track. So original, in the original paper, they mentioned um, that you should measure it in three-dimensional images for CT scan, which sometimes is not that easy. Um, the easier way to uh, the easier way to, look to, to measure your glenoid track is by doing your C MRI scan in both sagittal and axial planes. So, the way to measure in, uh, in sagittal plane of glenoid is you look at the glenoid, draw a full round circle, which you can easily do, and then measure the width, which is D. So, this is the diameter of the glenoid, okay, which is very easy to do. We know from the previous studies that width of the glenoid track is eight, 83%. Okay? So you multiply it with 0.83. Then the second thing to measure is to measure the bone loss. Okay? So this is again the deficiency of glenoid from that round circle. So this is a uh, small d. Okay? So in this image, I've put it there, so the whole diameter of the glenoid is 29.5. Then the bone loss is 4.8. Okay, so the glenoid track at the bottom of the screen, as you can see the calculation, is 19.6. We know what the size of the, your tire now. Now we need, need to know what is the size of your pothole. So on the axial scan of your MRI scan, you can measure the hill sacs on the medial margin of the hill sacs or the humeral head 
to the insertion of the rotator cuff. So in this image, I've put it as 22.2 millimeter. So if you, if your hill sac is bigger than your glenoid, then it is an off track lesion. So this is an off track lesion. So this is what gives you an idea how to treat this patient. So far okay everyone with this? Yeah. yeah. So now is this important? <clears throat> Some of the guys have looked at it. So they looked at, uh, so Tokish at all, they've looked at their uh, stabilization uh, with the four year follow up. And they've noticed that the overall recurrence rate was about 18%. But when they applied the concept of on track and off track, they noticed that, that the on track failure rate was only 4%. But off track lesion failure rate, uh, if they did bank heart repair, the off track lesion failure rate was about 75%. Okay. So, Burkhardt et al. They've come up with this uh, new paradigm. So they think that by applying this on track and off track concept, you can have four type of groups. Okay, which I put on the top, and they they came up with their recommendation how they should be addressed. So if you have a bone loss, glenoid bone loss more than less than 25% and it's an on-track lesion, you can do arthroscopic bank heart repair. But if it's an off-track lesion, despite the bone loss is not significant, you have to do something else. So it could, so they recommended you need to do a gram research. With it. But if it's an, but if the glomerate defect is more than 25%, even though it's an on-track lesion, you can't do arthroscopic bank heart repair, you have to do latch and they, I would recommend it that if the glenoid bone loss is more than 25% and the hill sac is, a, is an off-track lesion, then you have to do something else in addition to a procedure depending upon the engagement of uh, hill sacs. Okay. <clears throat> so from my side, I think the, the most important thing is you need to discuss with the patient what are their expectations. So most of the studies, I'll go again one forward. Most of the studies looking at it, these are the big bosses of uh, shoulder surgery, shoulder world, Christian Gerber, Pascal Bello. And they've looked at um, their bank heart and lateral J results and bank heart fail in around 25 to 30% of the patient. But lateral J failure rate was not very high. So you need to discuss with your patient what are his expectations um, you need to, I apply actually in instability severity score uh, to see if these patients are going to have higher score and are they going to fail. Um, I always check patients in, uh, appreh uh, do apprehension in about 45 degree of abduction to mid, uh, mid abduction external rotation. And I apply the concept of on track or off track lesions to see if they have bipolar bone loss. Thank you very much. Oh, well done. That's okay. So, question time. If anybody questions, I'm, I just made to make a comment in there. So, I I follow the same principle. The only cheat code is that uh, Bankard or, or Bookard actually took the concept from a, a very nice Japanese paper and made it his own. But it was a Japanese gentleman who started this concept. You must remember to make everything easy. You can't make it difficult. Not everybody is access, but I have a I have a system where they actually uh, map the glenoid and the humeral head for me, so it is easy. But, but look what Amir said, or Nasser said, we make sure that you know that it is, it is a, a monopolar or a bipolar lesion. So if the glenoid is missing and the humeral head is missing, then it's a bipolar lesion. Then whatever you do, you have to do something more than just an arthroscopic bank card repair. So I can't do remplissage in my hands. Remplissage is not very good. So I then do latage. So I end up doing latage in people who have a bipolar lesion. Of late, I have started doing the, you know, yeah, that, that picture you just show, uh, you know, the humeral head with a button. This is the um, Arthrex uh, Eclipse. So I have done that. I only had a patient last week when I was on call and he had locked dislocation anteriorly. I, I, I closed the defect with a button and did a latage for him. So that's worked for me. So uh, I do a lot of, a lot of latages. Uh, my, my indication for doing a bank card repair is going down very, very much because if they come with recurrence, they have missing. I can't do remplissage. I'm not sure what the view of the rest of the guys is, but yeah, very well, well done, Nasir. Well done. Question time, guys. No, yeah, I'm Sufyan. Yeah. Sufyan? Yes. 
what I like, you know, this is what I exactly I do as well. So like, you know, I discuss patients. What are they like? This is this is what now what I normally do. So if you notice, like, you know, if they have bone deficiency and they have arthroscopic bank heart, which is very like, you know, uh, I will do arthroscopic bank heart if it's less than thirteen percent. But if they have, especially if it's an on track. But if it's an off track, if you look at it, I do all uh, lateral jet procedures. So I again same thing. I struggle with ramp massage, so I do lateral jet. Yeah, okay, Sufyan. Welcome, everyone. Mr. Uh, Nasir, uh, excellent uh, presentation. I actually, I'm really sorry I missed the first uh, uh, sections of your, your presentation. So the thing is that now in every literature paper, in every uh, review article, you actually compare your recurrences with the on-track and the off-track or the placement of uh, the uh, hillside lesions uh, present on your humerus head. Now, when we actually, uh, when in the in initial days when actually we started uh, or actually I started uh, doing my residency and looking at shoulder dislocations, is there any correlation in between uh, the high beaten score or the current, uh, the, 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 uh, the hyperlexity uh, situation conditions in which you... Yeah, so if you look at the instability severity index of Pascal Bello, so he's uh, mentioned, so if you have shoulder laxity, then you score two. So that is uh, one of the prognostic factors that there's a high chance that the patient will fail. So age, okay, if they're contact athlete or overhead athlete, um, they have higher risk uh, of uh, instability. And then if you have someone who's hyperlex, they have uh, bipolar bone loss, they have, they have a very high chance of soft. <laughs> So guys, uh, mute your phone, yeah? yeah. Whose telephone is this? I can't control it, where it is, yeah? Not from my side, I can get it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, uh, while we're waiting, I can make a comment. You know, the thing yeah. is that st instability is an important thing, but with instability, you don't get, and, 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 and I have no evidence to quote this, but you don't get a bone loss that you would normally see in, in, in other shoulders. The reason for that is the tension and tone of the muscle. So the shoulder will dislocate and come back again, but it won't chip off the humeral head. It won't have a bit of, you know, bank heart lesion, or sorry, a bigger um, um, humeral defect. Yeah, it is not as common. I've got no evidence to support that. But in my practice, when I have instability patients, they have recurrent dislocations, but they don't have a big hill sag lesion and they don't make a pair of their glenoids. People who do not have instability, they have got a lot more common. Even two and three dislocations gives them a, a, a big hill sag. So I'm not sure what, what the experience of everybody else around me is, but but in my my view is that because of instability, the tone that puts the ball back and centralizes it into the glenoid is not strong enough for it to shave off the humeral head or the glenoid. It's only a theory. I've got no evidence for it. But in my hands and my experience, I don't see a people with instability having big bone losses. Um, yeah, well, no, I've seen some like you know, significant hill tax uh, and uh, I've seen uh, like you know, Glenoid loss is not like you know. I've not seen more than 20, thirty-five percent for bone loss, or or maybe they're not coming to me. They're going somewhere else. But uh, up to like in you know, a ten, fifteen percent, I've seen them. Uh, but the, the concept, the original concept was like you, know, you can do bank heart repair up to twenty-five percent of bone loss. Like you know, that was the inverted repair. But yeah, I, 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 I think that is what the current evidence is now. Isn't it? That there, there is less and less of bank heart repair and more and more of complex repair going on. Correct, correct. Yeah. Like, you know, more bony, bony repairs are, are going ahead. Absolutely. Like, and as I said to you, this, this, uh, this uh, couple of papers from Pascal Bello and, uh, and, and Christian Gerber, so these are not, not these are quite recent papers. And, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, I, I was in, in, um, where was I? I was somewhere anyway, but the, Gerber is an anatomist. He's not a, a, a surgeon. So what he says is based on cadaver studies. And, and no, this is, this yeah, is, Pascal Barlow, uh, he does what is called a con uh, incongruent lattice, day, where he actually does a tr three in one, where he takes the coracoid, he takes the coracochromal ligament, and he takes the sling of the common tendon. 
but because of the step in it, because he's not doing congruent repairs, his results, he has a high failure rate with, with more than 10%. However, if you go to, to uh, surgeries that are done by Joe DeBear, he does a congruent repair, and also the, the American guy from San Antonio, Texas, what was it, Stephen Burkhardt, they do a, a congruent repair, and they have less instability and less complications. But again, that's a debate that nobody has actually sat down and had that should we do congruent or incongruent repairs anyway. Yeah, so I, I looked at it. So if you, on the same note, like you know, if you look at Walsh, uh, uh, he's like, I you know, he's the guy with the original lactic J. So his recurrence rate is 1% and is over 1,000 patients. Again, if you look at uh, Krishnan, uh, uh, Gerber. Dimit Krishnan's uh, from, from Texas, like, you know, he does normal, so like, you know, standard uh, lactic J. And his uh, recurrence rate is again less than three percent. So I think so. There is no, we don't know which which one is the right one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so just just understand the technicality of it. Okay. The technicality is that if you're doing a three-in-one repair, which is what uh, Bailo or, or Hans Gerber or or, or Laxiger did, or what uh, uh, you know, uh, what's his name, uh, Jilly Walsh is telling you to do, it's a three-in-one. So you will have a patient who has a very stable shoulder but you'll have different complications because there's a step in it. However, if you look at people who are prescribing the congruent lactic A, then they have more instability because they're not doing the third part of the stability, i.e. put the cracker criminal ligament and close the capsule. Because if you look at these guys, they open, you know, subscap and transfers approach and just, just put the bone in there and, and close it. They don't do anything to the capsule. But anyway, well done. So, oh. so, so the difference, the, the, the little difference, so what, what the original lactic J is, you repair, see a ligament to the capsule okay and but but uh, the so this is what the, uh, walsh does and if you look at the congruent art which is described by burkhardt so what he does is he put an anchor okay uh, at the junction of the congruent art and the glenoid and he so in in order and and he repaired that directly to the, to the capsule in order to make this uh, bone um, reconstruction extra articular so I think there is some element to that, but I really don't know which one is the right one. I think yeah, so. we, 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 when we do the Arthrex meetings in Munich, this is all discussed at the time. So nobody is now putting anchors and doing extra articular repair with it. There's nothing to, done to the capsule. All you're doing is extending the articulating surface to stop from engaging and getting off track. And, and the, the sling does it, but you cannot repair the, 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 um, the cracker ligament if you are doing a congruent lateral J because then the ligament is on the side where it can't be brought across like the tip. That's the technical problem. Anyway, so so Kamran Saab, are you ready? I am ready. So can you hear me? I can hear you and I can see you're trying to show us a picture of your computer. Yeah, that's right. The reason I, I am uh, on holidays with my children, but thank you very much, Mr. Shah. Uh, Nasser did a very good presentation. So, uh, when he did a very nice presentation, I said, I will do something more funky. Okay. So, always, always, you gave me slap. And, I mean, you didn't, <laughs> you didn't slap me, but he gave me slap. Okay. So, so do, you, do you want to share your presentation? Press your share button, isn't it? Well, I have a few problems going with the, with, the, with the roaming, you know, on the internet. So that's why it's giving. So I think, can you see that? We, we cannot see it on the screen. So you still have to share it, like, isn't it? Can you, can you not see there? there it's no? very small. Yeah. Okay. I'll make. Okay, it we've clicked. No, we've clicked your picture so we can see you now. Yeah, that's that's a bit better. Okay. Is that better? I think we have to get. So everybody video. on your screens, can you click uh, 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 WhatsApp's picture? Then it'll become bigger on your screen. Then can can everybody do that? Yeah. Okay. Go yeah. on. We can see now. What is the slap lesion? Yeah. yeah, yeah the yeah. slap. You see, you know the way we have everything fashionable things. So from 80, somebody started describing this thing mm -hmm. and it started to become fashionable. The reason I give you, every time I'm scoping and somebody's new one is there to learn, and soon you put a scope in and you know what he says. He say, oh, this is slap lesion. So when I ask him what is slap lesion, he can't describe. So the same way, I think lots of people are confused about this, still on this date. Well, anyway, we all know that it is the challenging problem. It is the problem we retrospectively diagnose. We go inside, like for, I, will, I will say that in my practice, I have a suspicion, I have a very poor support with the MR arthrogram. I go with these patients 
and I diagnose them on arthroscopically. So once you diagnose them, and the whole thing is a very challengeable, you really need to ask a question to yourself. Is it really a problem? Can we diagnose it preoperatively without retrospectively looking at? Who gets it? Is it necessary to treat or is it something just to throw or get it? Uh, is this really a controversial? So we all know that the bicep, what it does, the long head, it goes intraarticular. So it's a very important part in the pathology. It's not a French or a UK issue anymore. It's, it is a pathology. It, we have to recognize it. And we know it is extraarticular, intraarticular. We know that it's, it's a different game. So what's next? It's really, it is very common. In my practice in Pakistan, I have seen lots of lots. In army practice, I do. And I do civilian. We do a lot of overhead activity. We have cricket. We have throwing. We have people coming in with pain. We have people coming in with clicking. People are making maneuver to show us sounds. People are showing us different things. So it is a pathology to me. And it's a very, organ very recognized pathology. So how we go about it. So we really, once we understand that superior labral anterior posterior, where the bicep goes and anchor does cause pathology with these people. So how we describe them. So the man behind all those things is standard. In the 80s, he did about 700 arthroscopies and he came up with this, this lesion mode description, which was actually arthroscopic. So what he said is that it's type one. He described actually two initially and then the, the other one came and now there are parts of it going. So basically in type one, there is only sort of degeneration. Type two, we all know that's the commonest. That's the one we see them a lot. Arthroscopically diagnose them where you can actually, the anchor is involved. A bucket handle, you see them, but not often. Or you see them type four at times. So it's really, really my concern is in cleaning every now and again, a young fella in, in our practice with a very vague posterior superior pain around the bicep. And a lot of them have dynamic problems. A lot of them comes in and shows you that I have a pain when I do that. And, and they are giving you history of late cocking, loss of velocity, power, snapping, instability. And then we have the the test to perform, which I don't think they can give you the exact answer. So let's talk about one by one. So the clinical evaluation for these patients to me is challenging. Or you still believe that they need a very good history, which I talk about it. The examination really good. These are the, the one we need to really go back to our third, third year, fourth year medical school knowledge. We have to have an, a, a good x-ray in case it's instability involved with the heel sac. MR arthrogram in our part of the world where I practice is very poor. I have managed only one person and still I can't get him to do it. And the goal is to make the diagnosis, not the MRI finding and then going it and it's not a diagnosis. Important thing in the history for these people, these as I already described, we have to dig into that history. We really have to know it's a big slide because it's a big thing we have to look around. We have to look around whether there is this vague pain, where is the pain? Again, what is the popping, the sound? And again, dynamic symptom. Then don't forget, if they are very painful, look for other pathology, cuff, ACJ, subacromial, bursitis, maybe developing some other. So really important that they are associated. If they are painful and pain at night, I will be thinking of cuff. And increasingly, I'm making a diagnosis of slap, sending them for the MR. And I'm also seeing cuff pathology with them. And they are, lots of them have supra or infraspinatus problem. So really an examination, good physical examination, really inspect it front and back, check it external rotation lag or not, check all the movement and look for it. Are we successful when we do that? Most of the time, not really. And then we rely mostly on to the couple of things. So I, in my practice, rely on number one, O'Brien test. I know it's not, not everything. A provocation test for bicep. I, and, and also on the MR arthrogram. So for the O'Brien test, I know people know about it very well. All you do is 90 degree of forward flexion. 20 degree of adduction, and then you thumb down, 
you resist and it's painful. Soon you supinate, the pain gets better. You can do different things. I know the Mayo Clinic described the clunk test, crying, those maneuvers. I don't want to do that. I can do, I like doing this. I like doing the provocation test for the bicep. What I do is I do one or two tests where I put them into the 90-90 position, elbow in neutral, and then I externally rotate the shoulder along with resist the supination. The same way I do in a funny way, and I check to see whether I can peel off that bicep and that can gives me some feeling. Obviously, imaging, as I said, we are very poorly supported with the image. Yes, but I still do this full series of x-ray of shoulder to see whether there is instability, hill sac, those things I'm looking for rather than actually more than that. MR, normally we get the normal MRI, poor films, but really look, if it is a fresh case, if it's an injury is fresh, the blood can give me some more support. But really looking for an for an intra-articular injection of, of a dye, which can give me an arthrogram before I can establish my diagnosis. And it's very, very, it's been shown that it's very, very sensitive and specific when you do MR arthrogram for these patients. Obviously, you're looking for a, for a, for a lesion. You do the dye, you see whether there is cup pathology associated with that and along with the, the dye escaping. Now, there I have a problem. Non-operative, what you do with them once you make a diagnosis? Already is a challenging, confusing, it's, it's there, it's, it, it, people understand, don't understand. But once you establish a diagnosis with a good history examination, O'Brien test, bicep provocative test, with the support of M arthrogram, then what to do with that? For me, non-operative doesn't exist. So you either modify their activity, rest them, anesthetize, and don't forget, people who are not familiar treating them, if you really want to inject them, inject them intra-articular because it's an intra-articular pathology. There's no point in injecting around. And then, does it really work? Not really, but it's worth a try for people who are sedentary, who doesn't want to do much. For young people, people who have this ongoing dynamic problem, people who have with the rotator cuff more than 50% tear, people with especially type 2 and 4, these are the ones which are coming back to us and need operative treatment. Now, there are tons of ways of doing these things. I am lucky enough. I, as a preferred, my approach is to not meet tenodesis, but just for the mentioning, yeah, you can look at it, you can repair it. We have two senior guys here, Mr. Shah and uh, Nasir, who, who must have experience of doing lots of repair. For me, I work in Pakistan. My intention is to do one operation. I don't like any stiffness, adhesive capsulitis in them. I don't want to come with another operation with them. My patients can't afford multiple surgeries. So I go in one operation and I tend to do that. But they're really fancy, modern, tricky way of doing them, avoiding into rotator interval, avoiding stiffness, doing knots, knots this way, not this way which with or without rotator cuff that you can do. And pretty much you can sort them out. But I have to see the evidence. Now, more and more people are coming. When you look at the literature, whatever we offer for these patients, you will find it's, it varies a lot. 25%, 60, 75 results, outcome. But the, my problem is the last line, the traumatic, post-traumatic stiffness, that adhesiveness, that involvement of rotator interval, manipulating through instruments, through sutures, through knots, leading to secondarily adhesive capsulitis. Our patient population don't move as much. We have a rehab problem. We get a lot of stiffness if you tend to repair them. And whether it need to be repaired or not, that's another question. So I like this, which is I tenotomize them. And I do, in my practice, a subvectoral, straightforward uh, tenodesis. And outcomes, we know that lots and lots of studies are there which talk about it, but I based on this table to return to play and in my practice, that why I prefer to do tenotomy and tenodesis. So first thing clear in population in Pakistan, anybody above 40, 45, I know you can challenge me, but we tend to, looking at his general health, we only end up with tenotomy. 
and we uh, and and the younger population they all go for the tenodesis now all these return to play different studies have shown slap repair against tenodesis so they're variable results but look at if the right side of the table they all are doing better than than slap repair and if we have a result like that with the outcome i would do one operation in pakistan and i will offer them either only not me if somebody is more elderly and i will do tenodesis for these patients in summary they are challenging really have to take a good history have to think about it not like coming as a fashionable in theater saying oh this is slap lesion so i would be very happy to answer any question uh, thank you very much and by the way pakistan is full of slap if both of you want to do any research there thank you okay so very good presentation uh, kamran i can make a comment okay so i have i have this uh, uh, theory or thesis that the, the the biceps tendon is a vestigial organ that has been given to us like an appendix and it is a source of pain right so we need to make sure that the biceps tendon where the problem is is it in the joint is it in the groove or is it beyond the groove so when you do some actual tenodesis it is what tendons a problem beyond the groove i agree with you I, I when i first became a surgeon i wanted to fix everything because i could but now i have patients who have a traumatic and non traumatic biceps problem if it's a traumatic problem and you are above the age of 50 you get a tenodesis you get a uh, tenotomy okay if you're below that age i will do a arthroscopic biceps tenodesis for you okay now if it's a non traumatic one that's a different ball game on together it's not the topic of today but if it's a non traumatic one you have to do subpectoral tenodesis then because the problem is in the groove it's not higher up like it said so you have to go beyond the groove so you do subpectoral my take on it is exactly what yours is i have stopped doing uh, uh, slap repairs i don't think so that it works at least in my hands if you're an athlete and you do a slap repair you're actually stopping them from doing their athletic work you're no longer uh, uh, um, fully functional with their shoulder and you cause them pinching and sharp pain so they all come back and i end up doing a tenodesis for them so now what i do is age if you're above 45 to 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 50 i may try to repair it but if you're definitely above 50 i will do it to not me for you but if you're below and you still work at least i will do a biceps tenodesis for you so that's what my plan is but yeah excellent talk any questions from anybody else thank you nasir any comment nasir very good very good um, presentation and i think so i agree with you so for, so for me i again like you i take history examination i will do exactly same i check for o'brien test and uh, they not diagnostic but is supportive i do for like speech test for biceps loading and the other thing that i do is i do apprehension test so in apprehension they won't be apprehensive but i'm looking for pain so if you do abduction external rotation and they are they getting pain then that probably means that uh, they have um, uh, a peel back mechanism inside so when i do they get pain in abduction external rotation that is also supportive of uh, that they may have slap problem okay so this is something else i i i do in addition to other examination and arthroscopically um so if once i know if they have a slap tear it's and i'm now just talking about uh, type 2 uh, rest of them like an apart from one which sometimes might be right for slap 2 i discuss with the patient and i give them that the higher chance uh, of failure with the uh, with slap repair and the higher chance of success with the uh, tenodesis or tenotomy so most of my patients just like yours will go for one operation but some of them they don't like the idea and they are happy for slap repair and i'm just again talking about slap 2 not 6 7 or 8 something yeah i mean i, I remember uh, jilly walsh saying you know i asked him what do you do for biceps tendon problem you know he said i kill them yeah no, what do you mean by i kill them he said i cut them when i just forget it like i kill them i absolutely agree and i am of a, of a firm believer as well so if you are a french surgeon or or european surgeon you'll be more to work cutting the tendons if you're more american then you'll be fixing them so for, for slap type 2 i discussed this with the patient so some of them they don't want to have it um and they want they're happy to try a slap repair and if it doesn't work they know i can still go and do biceps uh, tenodesis now if i'm doing slap repair one thing i just make sure i do, just like what you mentioned come on is um they get problem in the interval so i do capsular release so i do interval release 
and I release a little bit on top of this uh, of the biceps anchor as well. And, and, and so I just release a little bit on top of the biceps anchor as well. Perhaps that may improve uh, their external rotation. But as you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm more of a bicep killer than a biceps fixer, unless patient requests. So, but no, I agree absolutely with you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Azim, any questions? Uh, sure, Mr. Shah, can Hello. you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamran. It's always uh, very fun to listen to your talks. Uh, one one thing. Uh, uh, last week uh, um, I was in Munich uh, to for, uh, for a shoulder course, and uh, the thing is, that they actually told the same thing that uh, the subpectoral uh, bicep you know, this is is uh, the most uh, I mean preferred sort of thing, so you can get rid of the the biceps pathology inside the groove, and you are moving safely enough. One question to you, sir. Uh, in in Pakistan, the 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 technique of doing a bicep. Uh, uh, the inlay screws are very I mean, expensive. These days, they're not available. So what is the technique of doing a bicep subpectoral bicep? You know, this is you do an onlay technique, or you, you prefer and go uh, and put the, the, the tendon inside uh, the, the groove or inside the bone, giving it a, an inlay sort of an arthrosis. Yeah, thank you very much, Sufyan. Very good. What we do is uh, first of all, it's uh, we we are very we are conscious about the, the cost. By doing this, um, I mean, Mr. Shah is absolutely right. We can do at different levels, but for us, is one operation and less cost and less this. So what I did there was a comment uh, giving us a bicep inner lock system. We use one or two, which is expensive. So what we have started now, the way I do with my ACL supplementary fixation, is just with the screw. So all you can do is. You take off that part of this one and you put a screw and then you wrap around your fiber tape, uh, fiber wire on the bicep and you put on the top of the screw and then you screw into to the humerus and it's fine. I mean, it's just a matter of, of, of fixing and I, I immobilize them over four weeks. Yeah, you can criticize me up to five to six weeks and then I, I follow that. So I don't do any expensive stuff simple you drill the screw it's a very old technique we used for so many times and it's been working for a maximum maximum i wouldn't like to say that i mean the other ones are fancy it's beautiful it looks nice but they cost a lot of money you know so i, I wouldn't do that I just a simple so how much does an end button cost is it end button more expensive than a screw because you can do an end button isn't it you can pull it to the other side pull it and put yeah. the tendon in and the button is, I think, 27,000 or something. Wow. 24,000 is a lot. I think you cost 1,000 or 500 or something like that. And with the washer, it's fine, to be honest. What I would probably suggest. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you um, look at, there's a paper from a chap called Mike uh, W-A-L-T-O-M. And I think so it's published probably last year in Shoulder and Elbow. So they describe a very simple in, um, subpectoral intraosseous uh, fixation, so transosseous fixation, without any anchors. Yeah, exactly. With two holes, and then they pass biceps through those holes and, and tie it to itself. No anchors. I, I read that paper also. They have a higher than normal incidence of fractures also, like I said. But oh, I've, not seen, I've not done that. Like, no, but, uh, but that's, it, but it's, I'm very surprised. Unicortical fixation. Yeah, no, it, 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 I mean, the biceps doesn't cause problems. I think the only problem with the biceps is that if it has a dragging sensation, if you cut them acutely, and if you fix them with anything, it'll work. It has a second head, yeah. so it is not a problem. I don't think it's a problem for it to have power and put itself out and anything like that. But, you know, we, we are now experts here, so you must understand, Sufyan, there's a difference between why you want to do a septectoral and why do you want to do a proximal arthrodesis or tendinitis. The reason is if it's a non-traumatic event, then you have to miss the groove and you have to go subpectoral. But if it's a traumatic event, then there is no point in doing and going all the way down to, to take it. However, if you are going on the concept of one operation, then subpectoral approach is probably the best one, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, because I mean, I, I did them as because it's fun, you know, I mean, I cut them at the top and I have a suture in it and when I pull it, I go on the lateral approach and you can, you will see it on, on Tuesday, uh, uh, come around, we've got one specifically for you. So you keep pulling the tendon until you see where it is, you catch it and you screw it. It's not difficult, but 
it is certainly shorter than doing a, a slap repair. It is a lot quicker than doing a slap repair. But yeah, have, we'll have a look on Tuesday. But I think the cricket match is on. I'm sure everybody wants to go and see the cricket matches. And see. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to golf. You see, nothing. Just the golf, you know. So I'm already ready, you know. So I've done it. I mean, by the way, can you guys, Nasir and uh, Mr. Shaw can arrange a caddy for me in UK. It's so bloody hard to pull those trolleys, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Character building. I feel tired. I feel sorry for my caddy now. I will go and uh, will kiss his hands and I'll pay him double now soon I go home. You know, okay. you know these, it's a novelty to have a caddy in, uh, in the UK, you know. It's so difficult. Anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Shah. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Hopefully, we'll have a next topic soon. It's going to be knees next time, yeah, because the knees guys are complaining anyway. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye. No. Is, is Kazim still there? Yeah, yeah he, he woke up. He woke up. I woke him up. Is that, yeah, I mean, because I've not heard from you or spoken to you for ages, Kazim, yeah? When I told her things, so I try to make my most focus on it. When I'm more focusing on something, okay. that's where I started to close. We'll, we'll inshallah start news for you next time, then, all right? Okay. okay thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Learn, learn a lot from Mr. Shah. And thank you. Okay.